Jeannie, I'm wondering if you can um, do the co-host thing with me so I can start to. Yeah, and happens. I can, I'll, I'll hang out for a little while until it kind of seems to settle down, but I just made you co-host. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I think we can go ahead and start. It's depending on what clock I look at, it's either 7.05 or 7.08, but probably most have joined. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, the, um, this will be the presentation on uh, mosquito spraying with uh, Central Massachusetts Mosquito Control Project. And tonight we have Tim Deschamps, who um, is going to be presenting to us. Tim has been the executive director for the Central Massachusetts Mosquito Control Project since 2003. He is responsible for the planning and operations of a full-time year-round program of mosquito control covering 44 cities and towns in both Middlesex and Worcester counties. Services offered are larval and adult mosquito surveillance, larval and adult mosquito control, tire recycling, public education, ditch maintenance, beaver mitigation, and research and efficacy. Tim oversees a staff of 22 full-time and 10 part-time personnel in a state-of-the-art facility in Northborough, Massachusetts. Tim has worked in mosquito control since 1983. Welcome, Tim, and thank you for joining us tonight in presenting this information. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to present to um, members of the board as well as the public at large. So let me try and share my screen and see if we can get started. Yeah, fantastic. Is that coming through for everyone? No. Okay, let's try again. There it is. All right, great. I have a dual screen, so it is a little challenging sometimes. Is that full screen now? Yes. Yeah, it is now, yes. Okay, great, thank you very much. So yeah, I'll go uh, briefly through um, how we're organized and some brief biology, um, mosquito control in general, then we'll get to a little bit more of the specifics. Um, we are a state agency, mosquito control in Massachusetts is organized through Mass General Laws chapter 252. Each of the districts has its own enabling legislation. Ours is chapter 583 of the acts of 1973, which was when we were formed. All the organized mosquito districts operate under the authority of the State Reclamation and Mosquito Control Board. That is a volunteer board that has members from Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, Department of Conservation and Recreation, and Mass Department of Environmental Protection. They do meet on a quarterly basis and are a great resource for the mosquito districts. And we do have important par partnerships as well, especially with the Department of Public Health. And our district also has partnerships with two EPA programs, the Pesticide Environmental Stewardship Program, as well as EPA's WasteWise program. All the districts are overseen by a board of commission that is appointed by the State Reclamation Board. Our board of commission meets monthly on the second Wednesday of each month, and it is an open public meeting. Briefly, mosquito biology. Uh, mosquitoes go through uh, full metamorphosis. They have four stages of development, egg, larva, pupae, and adult. The first three stages are dependent upon water. 
Um, the, the first three stages are aquatic, eggs are laid either in water or near water. Larvae and pupae do need still stagnant water in order to develop and then hatches the adult mosquito, which um, most people are familiar with. Uh, mosquito adults is um, about 2,600 species worldwide, approximately 162 in the United States. We have identified 52 separate species in Massachusetts, about a dozen or so. We are concerned with uh, transmission of viruses to either humans or horses. Um, it is the vector of several diseases in the Northeast, uh, Triple E being um, the most serious, West Nile virus, also another um, disease that can be transmitted by mosquitoes. The flight range of the adult mosquito is variable and uh, does depend upon species. Most species that develop in artificial containers stay relatively close to their larval habitat. Um, there are other species of mosquito that can fly up to 25 miles. It's not uncommon for us to find a few specimens each year of species that can only develop in salt water and we're approximately 20 to 23 miles uh, from any salt water habitat. The several different types of larval mosquito habitat in the Commonwealth, uh, the ubiquitous retention detention areas, woodland pools, um, river reflood areas, the white cedar red maple swamps, permanent water, degraded ditches, artificial containers, and salt marsh. Mosquito control in Massachusetts is organized in 11 different districts. Um, historically, we're set up along uh, county lines. Uh, we were the first district to be formed in both uh, in two different counties because we operate in both Worcester and Middlesex counties. In the Pioneer Valley is the newest mosquito district, which was formed in um, 2017, and they're currently operating in the three um, counties out in the Pioneer Valley. This is a statewide map of all the mosquito control districts, the colors signifying the different mosquito districts. We are pretty central in the green color, and I did circle the town of Sherborne. Just so you can see that you are bordered by Norfolk County Mosquito Control to the south and East Middlesex Mosquito Control to the north. The communities that are in white do not currently belong to any mosquito uh, control program at this time. And this is just a slightly expanded map of our current service area, um, 44 communities in, um, again, both Worcester and Middlesex counties, that dark line being the county boundary. The suite of services that are offered to residents and town officials and all of our member programs. Uh, we have six proactive services, surveillance, public education, ditch maintenance, larval control, source reduction, which is uh, tire recycling, a relatively new program for us, beaver mitigation. The adult control is a spraying program, which most people are familiar with. Um, it is considered a proactive and also a reactive service as well. By controlling adult mosquitoes before they become infected with virus, um, it can be considered a proactive approach. And then finally, um, we do have the ability for research and efficacy as a checks and balances in our operational uh, procedures, as well as looking into um, new areas of control or new products that are available to the market. Mosquito surveillance is, um, you know, the driving force behind our program collecting this data and, and knowing what is um, currently happening in the environment. We do employ several different uh, tra trap types. These are just but a few. The gravit trap on the upper left has a wash pan that um, lays on the ground. We put water that's been infused in hay so it gets a high bacterial count that attracts female mosquitoes that are looking to lay eggs. The word gravid means pregnant or egg bearing. So as the female mosquito attempts to land on the water to lay her eggs, she's drawn up into that um, the device on top, which is a modified toolbox. There's a fan in there as, as well as a collection chamber. And we can then go out and um, do the collections of these mosquitoes that have taken at least one blood meal and potentially have been exposed to um, a mosquito-borne virus. The CDC light trap on the upper right uses um, either light or CO2 as an attractant, then it is drawn into the very upper part. And then that uh, there's a fan there that brings it down into the collection device at the bottom. We take the light out and only use CO2. So we get a fairly clean um, collection of um, just mosquitoes. If we put the light in there, we will get a lot of moths and beetles that um, are not necessary to be um, collected for our program. Then finally on the bottom, those are called resting boxes where 
if you take a, a box, if you paint it black on the outside, red on the inside and face it north, you, there are one or two different species of mosquitoes that may attempt to rest there during the daytime. So we will set these out generally in areas of species that we know can transmit the triple E virus. We will go out, put a, um, a clear plastic cover on the top and then use a handheld um, suction device, a, a modified flashlight that acts as a vacuum and do collections um, from those devices there. Education is another important aspect of our program. Prior to COVID, we did have a very active um, educational program in area schools, as well as presenting to civic groups and um, at-risk populations such, such as senior citizens. Here's our entomologist doing a presentation um, at a school program. He's been doing that since around 1985. In, in the past, we generally see um, from about 1,500 to 2,000 students during the um, late spring, early summer months, just prior to school being let out. Our uh, staff biologist developed a senior citizen program, educational as part of his master's degree. So he does those presentations as well. Again, this was prior to COVID. We're hoping our um, public educational programs will start up again fairly soon. And then of course, we do have other personnel that are available to give presentations to um, civic groups, um, town boards, et cetera. We do have a fair amount of educational materials that are put in all of our um, city and town halls, given to libraries, passed out during health fairs, et cetera. And we are fairly active on social media, such as YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Our educational program was recognized in 2013 by the Commonwealth of Mass um, for the work that we've been doing the past um, 20 plus years or so. Ditch maintenance, the, um, the goal here is to restore drainage systems to historic flow patterns. Again, mosquito larvae need to develop in still stagnant water. So if we can um, reduce or eliminate um, those areas and bring the, um, those ditch systems back to historic flow patterns, we can accomplish the goal of no larval habitat and no need for pesticide applications. All this work is um, assessed by a wetland scientist we have on staff. She's a former conservation agent. Most of the work we do is accomplished using low impact um, tools, hand and power tools, rakes, clippers, et cetera. We do have specialized low ground pressure equipment um, for more extensive projects, which obviously would require more site evaluation as well. And also we do not perform any work um, on private property until and unless we have receipt of property owner permission. Larval mosquito control, surveying wetlands, our technicians are trained to identify mosquito larvae in their native habitat, and then they will do applications at that time, typically of bacterial products um, that we have to um, you know, not allow these mosquitoes to hatch from um, those wetland areas. Our primary um, weapon is BTI, which is um, Bacillus thuringiensis is relensis, which is uh, very specific to uh, mosquito larvae. Um, we have been using um, spinosad, which is another bacterial product in some of our pre-hatch um, program. There's another bacteria available to us as well, Bacillus fericus. We have an insect growth regulator that we do um, use in our catch basin program. And then we do have some um, surfactants that are either petroleum based or derived from plant extracts. Those two um, formulations in red are organic formulations that we are able to purchase and use, and they do have the ARMRI certifications that are renewed each year. Pre-hatch is putting down a bacterial product on ice in areas that we have historical larval data. So this allows us to expand our larval control program. We do the, we've been field, field testing this program for the past four years, went operational last year, and are continuing to expand um, to get additional larval control done um, as needed to um, reduce the need for the adulticide program, the spraying program. This is just our standard larval control program. Technicians, again, will go out. They'll take dip counts in, in the water, and if they find sufficient numbers, they'll do applications of a BTI product um, at that time. Catch basins is an important program for us. Um, these are specific habitat for certain species of mosquitoes, some that can carry West Nile virus. So we do have an active catch basin program in all of our member communities. Um, as you can see, since 2003, we've applied to over 1 million catch basins. 
And this is a screenshot of our um, digital program that tracks our catch basin applications. The green and black circles are basins that were recently treated, so they do not need to be treated again. And the red and black circles are bases that were treated but need to be treated um, again. Obviously, our pesticide products only have a, um, a limited shelf life, a, a limited active life according to um, their formulation, but we are able to track all of our um, applications through our um, GPS programs. Abandoned pools are another um, important habitat for mosquito larvae to develop in. We do encourage um, our health officials as well as residents to let us know if there's a pool that's in the area that's been abandoned. We can apply um, bacterial products that will last the whole season, so it only needs to be um, checked and treated by our uh, technicians um, once per season. And then abandoned pools that we do have database, we do send letters out to those residents each year asking them to let us know if the um, pool still exists and if they would like us to come back out and do a retreatment. Source reduction is reducing or eliminating larval mosquito habitat. For us, that means tire recycling. This program began in 2010. Initially, we operated off a uh, grant, but funding, and we do fund it now um, as part of our operational budget. We are almost up to 40,000 ties recycled to date in, in all of our member communities at some point in time. Ties are a, a, another preferred habitat of several species, some that can transmit West Nile virus. So the ties that we do collect are brought to a recycling facility in Littleton where they're ground up um, generally same day and then shipped out to be used in road, road products or other um, um, devices that they use. We have several different parts of this program, large um, tire sites that we have database. We've cleaned up new, uh, numerous, a number of those as well. Residential waste tire removal, a curbside program. Um, residents can call us, we'll database their information. When we have a truck scheduled for the area, we will then contact them and ask them to bring them down to the curbside. Waste tires that our technicians find along the road, they'll just pick them up, put them in the back of the truck and bring them back here. And then we also have done a lot of coordination with communities during um, their annual recycle events, hazardous waste collections, um, property cleanups, et cetera. This again is a graph of our tire program um, from year to year. So as you can see, we average approximately, you know, 2,500 to 3,000 tires um, on a given year with some years we've actually been more active. And this program has also been recognized by both Mass Recycle in 2011 and the EPA Region 1 in uh, 2014, and then a certificate uh, from the WasteWise program, EPA's program where they do, um, um, people put in information on their recycling activities. EVA mitigation is still a relatively new program for us. Um, our goal is to um, achieve proper management of populations to reduce the, the negative act aspects of beaver activity. Um, we do work under the emergency permitting process through the Boards of Health as well as Conservation Commission. For us, it has been, it has, um, been the installation of water level control devices as well as dam breaching. We do have licensed trappers on staff as well as a company that is on contract. However, um, to this point, we have not done any uh, beaver trapping um, at this time, we've been able, able to have most of our success with the um, water level control devices. This is just an example of a few um, different types that are out there. Um, each site, as you would imagine, you know, does require um, a lot of flexibility, a lot of um, sometimes going back and forth to determine the best way to manage that area. But this is a, an area in Holliston at, at the upper Rip, uh, Charles River watershed. That organization reached out to us. The um, device on the right side, those um, green and white, those are floats where um, we float out that cage de um, design. And the black tube is a culvert pipe that once we get the cage out to the um, appropriate um, level, it, that will sink down. The culvert pipe will go through the dam. Beavers will um, are attracted to the sound of rushing water. So a dam breach is gonna activate their um, innate ability to um, do a repair. By breaching the dam to the level we want, dropping that device in, they will come back out and attempt to um, repair the dam where the culvert pipe is. However, where that cage is, it is still is allowing the water to go through, and we're um, hoping to maintain that level that um, you know, we deem to be appropriate. 
Adult mosquito control, these, these are targeted applica applications to control adult mosquitoes and reduce risk from mosquito disease. Uh, the product that we're currently using is called Edofenprox, which is classified by the EPA as a reduced risk synthetic pyrethroid. It is not a residual product. It does have very rapid decomposition in the environment and also has low toxicity to humans and pets, um, et cetera. These are the application rates from the, from the label itself. Um, we do um, most of our applications at the very lowest label rate. So it's a 4% solution that we apply at 0.75 ounces per acre at a vehicle speed of four and a, at, at a flow rate of four and a half ounces a minute at a vehicle speed of 10 miles an hour. So um, being a 4% solution, especially, it is a very dilute, um, very small amount of that offense product that's actually going out into the environment. Pyrethroids are very commonly used um, in flea sprays and shampoos, restaurant applications, and is um, for the most part, the only type of pesticide available to homeowners over, um, over the counter. All of the pesticides we do use are available in homeowner um, formulations as well. Nothing we use is considered rest restricted use or, or high risk. This is a screenshot of the Holtz Ultra Guard, which is a topical flea and tick. Um, drops that are put on um, dogs. And as you can see in the blow up, this formulation is actually a 55% um, formulation of Edofen products with a 10% formulation of PBO. The um, product that we use is a 4% solution with um, that does not have any PBO at all. PBO is just a synergist, which allows the pesticide to work a little bit better. As far as our adult control or the spray program works, we operate off requests from residents or town officials that register either through our, the website or through our phone system. If we do not receive requests for a community um, on a scheduled night, then we will not perform any spraying. However, we will work in town um, doing larval control landing counts, um, depending on what's um, most important to be done at that, at that time. Um, if we identify virus in town, we always coordinate any interventions with our local board of health um, you know, we will give a recommendation, make the discussions with the local board, and then um, if spraying is um, agreed upon, then those maps are, are put out on our website and our social media accounts as well. We have redesigned our website. So now when a resident puts in um, a spray request, and if they do give us a, an email address, they will get an email prior to the spray. Generally, they go out by 10 o'clock in the morning. All our spraying is done after sunset. So they'll get an email that morning saying that we're, their area is scheduled to be done that night. Um, we have a new GPS tracking system in place and all of our um, spray, spray rigs, which does include um, Windows tablets. The uh, spray areas are detailed in a new reporting system that shows exact locations and time of spray. And our trucks are also equipped with ultrasonic weather stations so that the technician has real-time information on wind speed, wind direction, and air temperatures. There are some label restrictions on temperature and wind speed. So this is important information for them to have. Prior to the installation of these weather stations, they did have handheld um, units that they could get that information from as well. This is a, a screenshot of one of our um, trucks that was spraying in the area that night. The red, um, red diamonds are with the arrows are where the truck was being tracked, but no spray was being applied. The green areas are where the truck was doing the applications. And then those areas that are in the orange color are exclusion or no spray areas. So we are able to, um, when we get a no spray um, property, we're, we're able to put it on our GPS systems and as the technicians approach those properties, um, within 300 feet, they start to get an audible and visual warning on their tablet system to alert them that they're approaching um, this exclusion property. As you can see that one in the middle of the screen slightly up, it borders two different streets. So it may have a street address on the road near the top, but the road to the right of it is something we need to be concerned about as well because that parcel does go um, fairly close to that road as well. And then we can also get information such as date and time, vehicle speed, the wind direction, temperature, um, et cetera, just by clicking on any one of those, um, any one of those icons. And this is just a little bit more information on the ultrasonic um, weather stations that each of the trucks have. 
The uh, black box at the bottom to the far right is what the technician would see with both wind speed, temperature, and direction. If wind speeds exceed 10 miles an hour or temperature falls below 55 degrees Fahrenheit, they will get warnings to um, let them know that their applications should um, cease for the time being. So the exclusion properties are no sprays. There is a process through the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. It was revised a few years ago. It is now an online process. However, people can still register through a paper form if needed. If they use the online process, it goes into MDAR and then within five minutes comes to our office here. And then generally we're able to integrate it in both our paper listings as well as our um, digital mapping you know, within a day's time. All of our technicians will go out with a paper list um, less than until the, um, you know, if the, the, the digital, if the, you know, their program starts to fail or they have, uh, you know, battery issues or whatever, they're still able to locate these properties through their paper listings. They'll generally locate them during the daytime. And then as they, um, you know, doing the applications at night, especially if the signs are out, you know, gives them that added um, assurance that they're getting close to that property. As far as our notification system, we do send out schedules to all of our boards of health, as well as city town clerks, two weeks prior to the start of each month. That will give a, um, a day of the week that we have that community scheduled. We will then put on our phone system and website by 3.30 each day, specific locations in each of our communities. So there would be a listing of the town and the street names that we have scheduled that night. Um, obviously, there are times with such with weather events that uh, we're not able to perform all of the applications. So it, when that does occur, they get turned back in. An email gets sent out to the residents saying that their application was not uh, performed. However, it would be rescheduled at a, um, a later date. Then we are fortunate to have a, um, a research and efficacy program in place as well. Um, we, it began in the year 2006. He also does our GIS work. Um, some of the past studies that we've done is um, doing analysis of mosquito blood meals, finding out what species of animal they're feeding on, efficacy of some of our um, both adulticide and larvicide programs, host seeking, you know, what mosquitoes or species are active at any um, given time of night. Um, the pre-hatch program that I mentioned um, a while ago um, is now fully operational. We do perform uh, bottle assays looking for pesticide resistance. We've been performing those um, for over 15 years and have not noted any um, resistance to any of our adulticide products at, to, up to this point. Just briefly about mosquito-borne diseases. The mosquito is considered a vector or the one that transmits the virus. Both West Nile and Tripoli e are um, in the bird population, so they're considered the reservoir. They're the ones that hold these viruses. They bring viruses up during their migrational patterns. So there's certain species of mosquitoes that prefer to bite birds only. So they will bite a bird, pick up the virus, lay eggs, then subsequently look for another blood meal, bite another bird, thereby transmitting the virus. That's how it amplifies in the um, bird populations. There are, other, there are other species of mosquitoes that um, are more indiscriminate. They don't particularly care if they're biting birds or biting people. So they might bite a bird, pick up the virus, lay their eggs, and then subsequently bite a horse or a human and thereby transmitting the virus um, over to us. And then um, subsequently there, there's the possibility of infection. We do know the species that have these types of preferences. So our surveillance program is geared towards capturing these species so we can get um, an early indication if there are um, viruses in the environment. Some numbers from last year, we did find 144 mosquito pools or collections positive for West Nile virus in our service area. Actually, this is statewide. Um, there was one horse statewide and 10 humans um, statewide that did have um, West Nile virus last year. Thankfully for Tripoli, which is a much more serious disease, um, it was not found anywhere in the state. So uh, we were fortunate that um, with, we're thinking that some of that rain that we had uh, may have suppressed some of the uh, mosquito biting behavior at a point in time that they weren't able to pick up the uh, Triple E virus and therefore transmit it to um, horses or humans. And then lastly, just some personal protection measures. We always like to put 
um, in our program. Um, there are some good repellents on the market. Um, permethrin is, is, is one of them. However, it is recommended to be used only on clothing. But d picaridin and oil of lemon eucalyptus. Um, we do recommend people use a repellent that has an EPA approved or an EPA established number on it. Um, only because it, it has then gone through some product testing to show that um, not only does it um, work, but um, you know, there's less, like, less likelihood of any adverse reactions as well. And then this is just some of my um, contact information here. Um, so I hope I didn't uh, go too fast for people, so. Thank, thank you, Tim, that was great. Um, do, you have, do you have time to entertain questions? Oh, absolutely, as long as needed. Super, super. So I think I saw a question come in through the chat. I um, mm -hmm. will just read that. So we have a question here. How can a town institute a town-wide exclusion from spraying of neurotoxins? The exclusion process is strictly geared towards uh, private property owners. So there is no mechanism at this time for a town-wide exclusion. Um, the opt-out procedure, which is for aerial adult deciding, that is a separate process that we don't have um, really any input on. That is a process that could be done through Mass Department of Agricultural Resources. Honestly, I'm not too well versed in that, and I would I would refer you to them to find out what exactly would be needed. But that again would strictly be an opt out for any aerial or airplane slash helicopter applications. It would not um, affect our program itself. Um, the exclusion process that I described earlier um, is for private property owners um, to exclude from our program. Okay, thank you. Did that did that answer? The question, Tom, for you? I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, not completely, yeah. but, uh, but I'll. Uh, I'll but but you'll roll with that? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll roll. Uh... <laughs> OK. Um, and we have another question that came in. Um, how, does, how does one get no spray plaques? Um, that's something the in the regulation just states it simply has to be um, a white paper plate with the words no spray every 50 feet along the boundary of the property. Um, I believe the department's intent was to make it as least expensive as possible. Um, there are some organizations, I honestly don't know which ones, but I've, I have seen some more so-called official looking signs, you know, something on um, either printed on wood or plastic, but um, I don't know what's out there um, in that regard. But again, the regulation was intended to make it um, as least expensive as possible for, uh, for the residents. Okay. Um, I have another question that came in through the chat and then I'll go, I see Michael Lesser has his hand raised and then Daryl Beardsley has her hand raised. So I'll ask this last question I see from the chat here. Does the program reduce the numbers of mosquitoes in wetlands and could it be impacting populations of bats in the area? The um, larval program that we do have, um, the bacterial product is very effective. Um, larva siding is, you know, one of our major focuses because we can get them while they're contained in that habitat. Obviously, when mosquitoes are flying around, they're um, a little more difficult to, uh, to control. But yes, um, it is very effective in the wetland habitats. Um, the research that we have seen do not show that mosquitoes make up a majority of a bat's diet. So that you know, if mosquitoes were reduced in a certain area, um, the bats still would have plenty of opportunity to go after the the larger meals, like a June bug or you know a large moth, would, which would give them a lot more of a um, um, a meal than a, you know a dozen mosquitoes would in, in comparison. Okay, um, M Michael, why don't you um, sure. go ahead unmute? Hi there. Thanks for the presentation. Um, you, sure. didn't go too fa you didn't go too fast. It was great. Um, I was wondering, in terms of the spraying from the street, I'm just trying to see the nitty gritty of if one person calls in and says, I'd like to get spraying, how do you decide how much of an area that you spray around this person? I see the red and the green, mm -hmm. on that map, but what does it really mean if just one person on a street calls in and how much will you then spray around that person's? area there 
It, it will vary according to the conditions um, at the time. The technicians will take a look at the area. Um, first, they need to determine um, if spraying is warranted. You know, we have certain triggers either through light, light trap counts, um, landing rate counts, um, and as well as the weather to make sure that the application is even um, appropriate at that time. Um, if they do determine that, you know, the proper course of action, they also then need to look at are there sensitive areas around? Are there no spray exclusions? Are there um, fish bearing waters that need to be avoided? Um, drinking water supplies, et cetera. So they'll need to get a lay of the land to determine the extent of the application. And then, you know, they would also have to look at, you know, a town like Sherbourne, as you're all aware, is a fairly wooded town, fairly long driveways. Um, other communities that we work in, Milford, for example, especially in some of the downtown areas, the houses are a lot closer together. So, you know, applications in a, in a more crowded area um, would be limited, whereas um, in the town of Sherbourne, if we had a, a spray request and they had a 200-mile um, long, uh, sorry, a 200-foot long driveway, you know, if they can make contact with a resident, the resident would like them to. The trucks can go up the driveways um, to get, you know, a slightly better application as well. So I know it's kind of a long answer to a short question, but really it depends on what the technician sees at the time, according to a lot of variables that could be in place. So does that mean there? I mean, when they get a request to decide that an area is worth spraying, you're doing you're doing field work before the actual spraying to decide that there's actually enough mosquitoes see, captured or somehow trapped in, the, in that address. Um, yeah, they'll more? they'll need to perform some data collecting. Um, we perform what are called landing rates, where um, you know the technicians will go out and they'll stay in the wooded area for a certain amount of time and count the number of mosquitoes that attempt to land on them. Sounds a bit silly, but it actually is a very good indication of um, the situation that, that's current, that's at, at that location at that time. We do suspend those landing rates once the virus is identified in the state because obviously we wanna to try to reduce the risk um, to our technicians, but um, there are other triggers that we use. You know, we have anywhere from 15 to 20 light trap locations located in all of our communities that um, we do collect on a weekly basis. So that gives us good population data as well. Um, you know, we can gather that information and then compare it to where the spray requests are coming in to determine um, if there's a likelihood of, of mosquitoes being sufficient, insufficient numbers there as well. So there's a couple of, of ways that we can look at to determine if the application is, um, is necessary. Can we get the information about where you have your standard me measurements for sure? Your the monitoring for Sherborne, like the are there really 15 sites in Sherborne? Is that something that could be made available that you're using? Um, I mean, I can give you a map that kind of is more of an overview. We, we, we try not to give out specific locations and it's not, you know, that we don't trust anyone. It's just that, you know, we do have to try to keep some of these areas a little bit more discreet, discreet because, you know, there are, unfortunately, each year we do have um, disturbances of our traps and, you know, sometimes they do get, um, you know, taken as well, but I can certainly provide a map that gives you kind of a, um, a real broad overview of where our locations are um, in the town of Sherbonne and, um, you know, to get an idea of, you know, how much of the surveillance is actually being performed. Yeah, it's partial. I mean, I know other people have questions. I guess I'm just trying to understand also a little of the practicality of a place like ours where there's a lot of properties that are two acre or more. Mm -hmm. And what it means to spray from the street and go driving down a whole street uh, for people who didn't request it. Um, what are we, how, you, how you make that assessment versus some areas where there's the more like one acre and it's a little bit different. And uh, but that's okay. That's a whole other maybe discussion. Yeah. I mean, most of the spraying we're doing is is targeted to to that property itself. Um, especially in Sherbourne, you know, with, you know, large acreages and long driveways, you know, we generally, unless we get a group of residents that call together and we can, you know, do them all at the same time, um, for someone in Sherbourne with a long driveway, you know, getting down the driveway um, to, you know, as close to the house as we can, part of the street as well, um, is generally going to be sufficient for, you know, a week or possibly even longer relief for them. And um, for the most part, you know, residents will call once, twice, maybe three times uh, for service over the course of the summer. Um, you know, it's not too uncommon to get 
the, and any resident that requests the weekly spraying, we do let them know that this just not, uh, we're not able to perform that. It is something that, you know, we do have to be cautious about because, you know, we're not there to service um, on a scheduled basis. We do need to make sure that we're um, doing it appropriately. Okay, thank you. I'll ask sure. you later. Now, um, Michael, you want to lower your hand? I think Daryl's next. And then I saw Richard Roberts, Robinson raise his hand. And then I have another question from the chat. So go ahead, Daryl. Okay, hi, thank you. Uh, so you can maybe start to tell from the questions we're a town that's pretty hypersensitive about what might be sprayed in town in part as I guess you know we have a lot of wetlands streams and you know just general water connections across properties in the town and we also rely entirely on groundwater within the town for our drinking water so uh, there's concerns about what effects these applications might have on um, on our waters. And I guess I, I'm happy to see that you've moved away from Anvil, which was a concern for us because although the active ingredient in that, the however you pronounce it, um, at 10% was something that was estimated to degrade relatively quickly. The synergist, the PBO, was something that could endure for years, and especially in water. So again, that's part of our concern. So when I just looked up, um, tough and pro how do you pronounce? Tough and pro mm -hmm. Okay, um, that is rated, uh, and I'm looking at the comptoxepa.gov. Uh, website and it's also includes information from Europe. So pretty generally, it's considered to have cause harm to breastfed children and has some reproductive toxicity. And it's rated as very toxic to aquatic life. So it is interesting if individuals can choose to be sprayed, but if there's drift or if there's a water body interconnected to other properties, the impacts might spread farther. Would that be correct? It, 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 is, it does depend. I mean, Edofan products is fairly widely used. Um, the, the, what we're currently using is called Zenivex, Z-E-N-I-V-E-X-E-4. And the four stands for the 4% solution. That um, pesticide itself is classified as reduced risk by the EPA. Um, you had a couple of questions in there. As far as our wetland treatments, the bacterial products that we use are non-reproducing bacteria, so they would not go into the water supply. There are no restrictions on the label as far as applying to, um, you know, well heads and things like that. And then the um, the spray program that we do have, you know, again, one of the um, challenges that the technicians have when they're about to do an application is to be sure that there's no, um, or there's the least likelihood of drift into a sensitive area, such as um, watersheds, uh, lakes, ponds, et cetera. So um, yes, all pyrethroids are classified as toxic to um, fish, for example. However, we're using an oil-based product at a very low concentration at a very low flow rate. So even if there were a misapplication over a water body, it would not be expected to cause any problem to any of the inhabitants of the water itself. We also currently operate under a National Pollution Elimination Discharge Program, which is a federal program. We're in our, currently in our uh, third five-year permit that if there are any impacts noted by anyone, the general public, our technicians, or whomever, um, and it's suspected that our products or procedures cause that impact, that would then necessitate an investigation by um, the EPA. And we have not had any of those reports been put in since, um, again, I think we're in year 11 of this permit. It's a five-year permit, and we just started our, our third one. And also, I would like to mention that the uh, Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program is a program through Mass uh, Fish and Wildlife that has locations of endangered species, either plant, animal, 
um, invertebrate or vertebrate. And we do work very closely with them as well. They do review all of our products and procedures, and there are currently no restrictions on any of our standard procedures using our standard products at this time. So in other words, if there's a neighborhood that's in a um, endangered species habitat, we are allowed to spray from the roadside in those areas because they determine that even if there's an endangered species of insect, our program would not have um, a significant impact on that endangered species. Okay. Um, thank you, Waldo, I guess. Right, so there's still some risk but you've been minimizing it, I guess is what you're saying. Absolutely, there's always risk in everything we do. And you know, our job is to determine um, what is the higher risk? Is there a higher risk of mosquito-borne illnesses or is there a higher risk or, or, detriment, or detriment from our applications or our procedures? Uh, in the fall, you know, once we, if we start seeing Tripoli or West Nile in September and October, nighttime temperatures get cool, mosquito activity is reduced. Children have gone back to school. Most of us are a little tired of outdoor grilling. So it's not uncommon for us to identify virus in September, or October. And generally our recommendation is not to spray only because of those, those items I just mentioned. That we, uh, you know, unless there's a, we feel a significant risk, um, you know, we would not recommend spraying because again, the mosquito activity is low. Mosquitoes are starting to die off through natural mortality anyway. And our exposure tends to be um, reduced um, at the end of the summer and the early parts of fall. So again, spraying is not something that we, um, it's not our first choice. It's always going to be um, after we've attempted the larval treatments, after we've attempted any sort of source reduction or um, some of the other mitigation procedures that we currently have. So it is a very good tool for us to reduce risk when virus is identified, but only when um, you know, that the risk of the virus is greater than the risk of doing the application, you know, especially when you know, weather conditions can be so variable. And is the ground spraying more effective at reaching the mosquitoes? I gather that the aerial spraying in a place is wooded with as much tree cover as we have here is not as effective. It, it, again, there's a lot of weather variability there, but I would, I would venture to guess that an aerial application would probably be more effective only because they can get better penetration and they can do more acreages than our trucks can. But again, that's going to be variable, um, you know, according to the weather conditions at the time. Sometimes we'll get, um, you know, a weather inversion where um, as the truck spray, it tends to kind of drift up because, you know, it's, it's warmer in the upper atmosphere and cooler at the lower or vice versa. In those instances, sometimes the aerial applications aren't as effective because they're, um, the pesticide being put out at 100 feet isn't able to um, get down to the ground as easily as if you're going from the ground and it going up. But again, there's a lot of variability in, in those applications. Okay. Right. I thought Laurie, it was more that it got stuck on the leaves without floating in the air and coming in contact with mosquitoes. But... The applications that we do are, um, they're, they're not the applications that um, a private homeowner or, or a pest control company would do. They are looking to lay down a residual product on the foliage and get days or even weeks of, of coverage or control, um, especially the for-profit companies. You know, they can't be going out, um, you know, once a week to a certain property. People just aren't going to put up with that, not going to want to pay for it. So they will come out with a product that's going to last a few days or a week or two. Our program is different. When we spray at night, we are targeting the mosquitoes that are currently flying actively looking for a blood meal. So, and also by spraying at night, we are minimizing impacts to beneficial species such as, such as bees and other pollinating insects. So by spraying at night, using a low concentration and low flow rates while the mosquitoes are flying, because again, we don't have residual product, but we spray at night, come along the next day, any testing of the environment in the area that we sprayed the night before, you're not gonna find any residues from the yellow fen products. And we're not using, there's no PBO included in it either. So um, we need to do the spraying 
when the temperatures are right, when the wind speed is right, because when temperatures are too cool, mosquitoes don't fly. When, temp when the wind is too strong, not only does the spray not drift properly, the, but the mosquitoes aren't flying either. So when the conditions are right, we can actually get a very good application done because those mosquitoes are coming from the wooded areas to the open areas looking for nesting birds or deer or you know us out there sitting by the fire pit. Thank you. Okay. Um, Richard, do you want to, and then we also, three other questions, I, the one, <clears throat> there's one still waiting from before in the chat, but there's two more that came in on the chat. So we'll go with Richard and then I'll go to the chat. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, let me uh, express some appreciation for the work you guys do. I've spent the last year and a half now at this point uh, involved in a state uh, panel looking at mosquito control. And I've, uh, I've got a pretty good uh, sense of, of uh, what mosquito control districts do and where you fit. Uh, it's, it's impressive. But I do want to ask an important question. I think it's an important question. Um, the, the product that you use, um, ZFX4, um, I could not find the label. I'm looking at the, the label for ZFX E20. And that says, as you probably know, I do not apply to blooming crops or weeds when bees are foraging the treatment area. And then it goes on to say, except, you know, in the cases of disease risk. Um, does E4 have that same restriction? And if it does, how is it that it can ever be applied since there's always um, pollinators out uh, at night, uh, maybe not honeybees, but other kinds of bees out at night resting on flowers, et cetera. Um, so that's first half of my question, the second half is, is how are you contacting uh, uh, people who keep honeybees uh, to make sure that uh, their hives are safe? The um, pesticide label for Zenovex E4 is available on our website if you wanted to look for it specifically. I would think that the E20 label is, is pretty similar because they're, they're the same product, just a, a different formulation. So yeah. um, I'm sure it's, again, the label language is probably um, pretty close to identical. The, um, the label states that yes, do not apply when bees are actively foraging on blooming crops. However, you know we do perform these applications after sunset. In the year 2007, the State Reclamation Board did come up with a policy to protect pollinators and that policy states that we are not allowed to spray until astronomical sunset, um, until after that point, and um, only before astronomical sunrise, unless um, Mass Department of Public Health has determined there's a significant risk um, for mosquito-borne diseases. So, you know, for nearly 15 years now, we have been observing the sunset sunrise uh, restrictions as part of our spray program. However, um, you know, when we are doing these applications, um, a majority of the pollinating species are going to be in more protected areas, and um, it's not expected that our nighttime applications are going to have any significant impact um, on them. Great. Um, I, I appreciate that answer, although um, I'm not, you know, the honeybees are, are quite different than, than solitary bees in their behavior and even in, uh, in the behavior of um, uh, bumblebees, which on my farm, I always see outside at night on my raspberries and other crops. Um, but the second part of my question was, how is it that you are uh, uh, interacting with uh, beekeepers uh, to make sure that their hives are, are straight? Is it, do they have to contact you or are you reaching out to, to beekeepers uh, directly? We try our best to reach out um, to the general public and any beekeeping associations, however, um, and our main recommendation is they should register their location as an exclusion through um, Department of Agriculture's process so that we can have that um, on our maps and, and be sure that we can avoid those areas. If they have hives at other locations, which is fairly common with some of the larger um, beekeepers, then you know we do encourage them to list those properties as well so that we can get um, that information on um, our, our systems here. It's not uncommon for our technicians to see a beehive um, when they're driving around these areas during the daytime. Um, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, a lot of them are fairly easy to identify. Um, however, some people like to use those, those fancier houses that um, you know, can be a little harder to find. But when they do see a, a beehive like that, they will make notations 
um, and we'll get those in our program as well. But um, you know, the process for exclusions is handled through Mass Department of Agriculture, and you know, we get out as much information as possible to our communities and, and residents through social media and whatnot. But um, it is ultimately the responsibility of the exclusion to um, let us know they want to be excluded. Okay, does that, are you all set, Richard? It looks like that. you are. Um, okay, so going into the chat, um, this one came in a while ago. What effect would spraying have on grass, particularly where horses graze? It shouldn't have any impact because it is a non-residual type of product. Um, it's actually very common for us to be contacted by um, horse owners to spray their paddock areas because as you're aware, um, both Tripoli and West Nile virus can be um, impacting horse, horses as well. We do put information out to any horse owners that we do have on file to recommend that they go through the vaccination processes to, for these diseases. However, um, you know, again, it's not uncommon for horse owners to uh, give us a call once or twice a season to have the spray truck come down. They'll put the horses in the barn, close it up, and you know, the truck will drive through and you know, within, you know, five, 10 minutes, we're done. Okay. Um, the next question from the chat is, to what extent can synthetic, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, perithoid, perithinoids? Yep, that's so that good, yep. Migrate into groundwater. Um, the synthetic pyrethroids, they bind to soil, so they do not migrate um, into, the, into the groundwater. And again, since we're using um, a non-residual product, the pesticide itself degrades very quickly. Um, so it is not a concern for groundwater effects either. If there are communities that have watershed areas that they want to exclude, again, they simply have to let us know where these areas are. Uh, we can get them in our program and the trucks will shut down as they get close to these areas. So any sensitive areas, we do encourage um, you know, people to let us know so that we can um, get them database and avoid as, as widely as possible. Okay, um, and what what is the impact of spraying on moth species? I'm not aware of any research that's been done um, on that, so I honestly couldn't say. Um, you have to realize that the pesticide products we use, we're the end user. It's not our responsibility to prove that either these products work or that they have um, negative impacts. That is part of the registration process that the manufacturer goes through in order to get the label created. So in other words, they will do a lot of those types of studies and work with EPA. And then finally, when the label is created, there will be certain restrictions on the label. There will be flow rates, application times and dates, et cetera. Um, so you know, ultimately, we work off what the label tells us. We try to do some of our, our own efficacy and, and non-target effects, but again, we're, um, we're an agency charged to the, for the control of mosquitoes. I'm fortunate that you know, we have a large enough staff that we can do some of these um, projects on the side, you know, pesticide resistance management, et cetera. But ultimately, um, the non-target effects, as well as whether it works or not, is the responsibility of the manufacturer, not us. Okay. Um... I see Michael Lesser has his hand up and then Tom Trainer is uh, right after Michael. So go ahead, Michael. Hi, uh, coming back to the spraying on the roads, uh, I forgot to ask about the issue about signage. Um, is that basically in a town like ours with uh, property lines that are 200, 300 feet along there, to what extent are the signs they're like a third fallback to some extent to, to the GIS that's in the trucks. Will you still basically honor all of the um, exclusion requests that are made online, even if no signs are out there, but it's basically kind of a fallback. How does that all fit? Cause we get into trouble with having a lot of signs. Sure, I understand that. Um, it's part of the regulations that state about the signage. We don't have any control over what the regulations are. That is something that is, you know, the regulations were put in place. It was a public meeting some years ago, and, you know, they are what they are until they're changed. That being said, 
it is a good backup for our technicians so that if our electronic systems go down or for some reason, you know, they, they spill a soda on their nose spray, their paper sheet list in the truck, if there's a sign that says no spray, that's about as clear as day, you know, at nighttime, if you will. That's a, a very clear message to them they need to shut down. Um, so again, I can't tell you not to use the signs because we encourage everybody to follow the regulations. That being said, once we get a location in our program, especially now that we're able to put the parcel data in there, um, our system is very good about alerting us um, within two to 300 feet that we're approaching that property from whatever boundary. Uh, again, if it's along a street that, you know, the house is on 42 Walnut Street, but it borders Oak Street, when we're on Oak Street, if we're getting within 200 feet of that parcel, the system's gonna let us know. So it's my recommendation to put out the no spray signs whenever possible. It's my experience, because I was in the field for 15 years, that 95% of the people do not put in, put out the signs. So it does make it more difficult. However, um, you know, in my day, it was simply, you know, using the eyeball where you find the, the location and hope to look for uh, the property boundaries. And then when you're spraying at night, keep looking at your list. Now the technicians have another process, um, the electronic digital process that give them additional um, notifications. So um, again, we recommend people put signs out. However, it does seem that a majority of people do not um, or, or, or are not able to. Okay, then I can see with that, right, the informal practicality of uh, possibly putting a sign at the beginning at, at each end might be the actual some compromise um, that might give some protection for us as well. But it's good to hear that basically you're relying on other methods. Um, would you, but coming back to whether you would spray, if somebody requested spraying, would you only do it if you found any signs of of disease or stuff? I was trying to get through the fact of how much you're relying on whether, or is it just if there's a nuisance issue that somebody's reporting? Um, there's, right. They, it, it, we do need to have sufficient numbers of mosquitoes present at the time, because again, we're not using a residual product. However, um, we don't use the term nuisance because it's difficult to determine whether a mosquito is carrying disease unless it's captured and tested. We do know certain species have the propensity to carry disease. We know where those species develop in the wetland areas, and we also know when they're active times of the year are. So um, if a resident calls and we find sufficient numbers of mosquitoes, we know those are mammal biting mosquitoes. We know that a majority of those species have, have the um, potential to spread the disease. So therefore the application would be warranted. When we do identify virus, there's a lot of decisions and a lot of recommendations that have to go in at that point. Um, as I stated earlier, you know, looking at weather and mosquito populations, the virus itself, et cetera. So it is a difficult question um, to answer, but, um, you know, we consider controlling an adult mosquito before it becomes infected and has potential to transmit it. We consider that a proactive part of our program as well. Okay, that makes some sense. Uh, I know I see Tom and others. I'll, I'm going to just have a list of things, but I'll just jump to one other topic of the... Uh, catch basin program that you have. Is that something that you're actively doing in Sherborne for all of ours? What, what's the degree or how do we find out? Or is that something you deal with our Department of Public Works? We try to coordinate as best we can with Public Works only so that um, we know if they have a ditch clean, uh, a culvert clean, sorry, catch basin cleaning program. Obviously, we don't want to do an application have them follow up behind us um, and, and dig it on out. But yes, we do perform basin applications in all of our member communities. Um, three years ago, I started hiring seasonal staff just to do um, those applications. Last year in Sherborne, we did apply to, I got my numbers in front of me here, 1,221 catch basins in town, which um, I would venture to guess is a pretty large majority of basins. Um, Sherborne itself, those those neighborhoods that. don't tend to have a lot of concentrated basins like uh, Milford, for example, just to use them again. Um, you know, we can get a lot more done um, in a day's time. There's more driving in Sherborne. But yes, the basin program is done um, on a weekly basis in all of our member communities each year. Oh, weekly. And, and that's the one that uses the, uh, the method, whatever. I couldn't remember what 
particular time? Um, yes, we, we use methoprene. We also use some of our more extended bacterial products. It kind of depends on the time of year. Um, methoprene, the, the, the formulation we use is active for about 30 to 45 days. So sometimes in some of our communities, if we're doing them early in the season, we might use a product, a more extended bacterial that might give us 45 to 60 days. Um, but again, we're, we're not necessarily looking to control the mosquitoes in that individual catch basin for the whole four months of the season. What we're looking to do is interrupt the cycle of um, larval, larval habitat. In other words, if we can control them through June and part of July, you know, then a week or two goes by, then by the time they start getting ramped up in August and then into September, there's very limited opportunity for those mosquito species to become involved in that, that disease transmission cycle. Do we have any control over what is put, like some of our catch basins might go into a pond or surface waters, others might not. Um, do we have any control over what's put in particular uh, catch basins? And again, well, it sounds like you would only do any one catch basin maybe once or twice. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, was yeah generally once a year. And the products we use, if they're bacterial um, or even methoprene, there are no restrictions on um, using them in any sort of um, drinking water situations. And methoprene itself, we only use it in catch basins because methoprene um, is very, um, it breaks down very quickly in sunlight. So it would not be a good product for you for us to use in a wetland, for example, because the methoprene, the mosquito, methoprene works a bit differently. The bacterials, the mosquito eats it, it creates a toxin, the mosquito dies. Other aquatic insects um, with BTI, for example, can come in contact with it and not have a problem. Methoprene actually mimics a hormone that the juvenile mosquito emits or secretes. And then when it reaches the, the pupa stage, that hormone shuts down, which allows it to, to finish its development and hatch as an adult. Well, if the pupa is still exposed to methoprene, then that development cannot happen. So it is not able to hatch out. But again, we only use methoprene in those cool, dark um, locations, such as a, as, as a catch basin itself. Because the BTI does not work as well in that kind of setting? It, it, it sometimes does not because um, in those settings, the um, they tend to be fairly high in bacterial counts, um, depending on the amount of flushing that we may, we may have for rain rainwater. Methoprene is, is not impacted by any bacterial amount at all. Using BTI in an area with high counts of bacteria, it reduces the effectiveness of the BTI itself. So methoprene is, again, a better product in that instance. Okay, well, we'll think about that more there. I'll let somebody else go before I wanna to talk to you about beavers. Thank you. Okay, Tom, you're up. Well, thank, uh, thank you, Cindy, very much for holding this uh, in the CONCOM joining. And uh, thank you, Tim, for making this presentation. And most of the work that uh, your Mosquito Control Board is doing, and let the record show, I hate mosquitoes. Uh, and many of you know, I like to be outside a lot. So uh, I have a love-hate relationship with uh, these bugs. Uh, I'm all for things uh, like your uh, bacteria lar larva control, control cer certainly source reduction and those mitigation measures. I'm, I'm all for that. The problem I really have is the uh, neurotoxins and the products that, that you're spraying and, and, and doing it you know, it sounds measured, but it's quite indiscriminate. And Sherborne, many of you know, you know, a town of uh, 16 square miles, about 10,000 acres, almost 5,000 of those acres are open space and uh, largely uh, privately owned. Uh, what, what some people on the call may not realize that are interested in this topic, that the neurotoxins that we're talking about they're extremely toxic to uh, other insects. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, none of these products are, are targeted towards the mosquitoes. They're very broad-based acting and the neurotoxic effect, uh, you know, uh, other invertebrates, uh, both uh, aquatic and terrestrial are gonna be decimated. Uh, and we know that 
from the uh, you know population drop uh, that's been huge in uh, in insects. Uh, does anybody see fireflies anymore? And uh, different aquatic species. So I would caution people to you know mitigate uh, their discomfort from uh, mosquitoes and, and other ways and. And please put up uh, no spray signs. Thank you. I just want to address one point. I mean, you mentioned neurotoxin a few times, and while technically you are correct, um, I would like to point out the fact that um, our biology is much different than an insect's biology. Um, the pyrethroids are very commonly used in um, lice treatments, for example. So, you know, humans do tend to tolerate these products with some exceptions, naturally. Tim, um, fairly Tim, well. I Tim, we agree. I didn't. I didn't talk about human. Okay. <laughs> it's it. The concern is is the destruction of uh, beneficial insects, and the birds and other higher uh, uh, order species that depend on uh, our insects. I'll give you another example: zooplankton. Zooplankton, which are small organisms that live in our surface waters. Uh, such as uh, uh, farm pond and other uh, important uh, waters in our town, zooplanktons are, are uh, decimated from uh, uh, applications such as this. And if you look at the food chain, uh, zooplanktons feed on uh, uh, negative uh, species like cyanobacteria, and you, you know, there could be a lot of different reasons why cyanobacteria is appearing much more frequently in our surface waters like farm pond, but there are some uh, biologists that feel it's uh, the use of uh, some, some products like this on a more regular and frequent basis. So no, humans, uh, you know, the size of humans and the low application rates that you're doing here uh, toxicity uh, is dose related. I'm, I'm not worried about human uh, uh, neurotoxicity. It's it's the smaller uh, organisms I, I'm concerned about, and and the uh, general food web in our uh, in our habitats. And again, just to clarify, I mean our, you know, the spray program is done by re request only. Um, so, you know, if an individual does request, you know, we might do an application. Last year, we did only receive 114 requests from area residents. And for the year total, we put out just over nine gallons of Xenovax E4, which again is only a 4% at a fen park. So we don't tend to do a lot of spraying in the town of Sherborne. Um, a lot of the mitigation is done through the larval control program. Um, but again, you know, a lot of what you mentioned, we're, we're concerned about as well um, as a, you know, as a, Curiosity factor a few years back, I remember looking up into, you know, what is happening to the fireflies? Because again, I remember as a child seeing them, you know, by the hundreds and now with children and now grandchildren, my own, you know, it's a very limited window. If at all, I can go out and, um, you know, get that jar and have hopefully catch a couple. And some of what I was reading and, you know, I'm certainly willing to be educated, but seems to be, you know, leaning a little bit more towards applications, um, ground applications. Uh, because I think part of their biology does depend upon, um, you know, loose, moist soil and leaf litter and stuff. But again, I'm certainly by no means an expert on that. But, um, you know, we do share a lot of your concerns and we limit our applications as much as we possibly can. Um, a lot of people feel that by using the products and procedures that we do can sometimes mitigate either homeowners doing it themselves or um, some of these pest control companies that, um, frankly, have some sus some suspicious business aspects to them and um, have no legal basis for reporting, unlike, you know, the, um, you know, the reporting that we're required to do so. Thank you. Um, so, Richard, I just wanted to read in case people couldn't see this in the chat. Richard uh, reports that the state task force, this is from a to go about the signage that the state task force is grappling with the question of what kind of signage is really needed in the GIS age, especially on larger properties. So um, I'm just reading that for the folks that are here in case you can't see it in the chat. Um, so, oh, Daryl, your hand is down. So uh, Michael wants to um, 
Michael wants to ask if, if no one else has any questions. Michael wants to ask about beavers. Hi, uh, I'm trying to find out what the scope is or what parameters there are for like individuals get asked for help with beavers or is it a town kind of request? How does that actually, uh, who can originate a request and, and what kind of costs are involved or, or how you decide when to actually uh, do some sort of water leveling device? We, we can, we, yes, we can take a request from a, a, a property owner themselves. Um, however, we do need to follow all of the emergency permitting processes through Boards of Health and Conservation Commission. So um, there are no, are no exemptions for that from mosquito control. So if there's a beaver situation, um, then our wetland scientists will go out, take a look at the area, um, hopefully coordinate with some other town boards as well. Conservation would be a, a great resource for us in that instance. If um, it seems like it's something that we might be able to assist in, Board of Health then agrees because they also have to sign off on the permit, um, you know, then we would move forward. The, uh, there's no, there's currently no cost to the residents um, for this program. We do have the ability to purchase the materials um, as needed. So, um, you know, we have not had to charge any private landowners or any of the, um, we've done a work on a few watershed association properties as well. So if you do have a situation, I do encourage you to, if you want to get in touch with me, that's fine. I can push it over or just go on our website. Um, there'll be a description about the program and um, you can get her email address uh, directly from there. But again, don't hesitate to either call or send me an email. I can certainly initiate the process as well. Okay. Uh, I see there's another hand, but I'll just uh, ask one other thing of of the 114 requests that you got in Sherborne in 2021, um, are those, do you end up following through on, on all of those or are those all the requests that you actually did spray versus a larger number? Just curious. That's the total number. Um, I did not peel it back far enough to see if applications were done in all of those instances. Um, probably not. Um, or I should say probably not at that time, you know, in, in other words, a request may have come in and if there weren't sufficient numbers or there was a weather situation, it would have been turned back in. And then if it was subsequently serviced a week or two later, that would still count as one request. So more than likely a majority of them were performed. Um, however, there are situations where um, we get a request and then they're too close to a no spray, they live right on the lake. Um, there are instances where our technicians will um, turn it back into the office and say they can't do it. So thankfully, through our um, email notification system, we have another message that states that we're unable to perform this application. Um, you know, please call us if you um, would like more information as to why. Um, but there are occasions where we can't do it. But I would, you know, I don't have the exact percentage, but probably a majority of those were done. Okay, and the last little part of this is whether you, how far does the spray when you're spraying from the street? I guess it just depends on how much, how much uh, vegetation there is on the sides, in terms of how the spray actually goes. If it's, if it's somewhat, uh, if it's open lawn on the sides, how far does it go? And if it's just treed or bushes and stuff, I'm just curious if you could offer some rough sense of, of. Uh, what the performance is of how far the sprays penetrate. Operationally for our um, calculations, we use a 300 foot swath. As you noted, that is going to be very dependent upon um, where it might impinge upon trees, brush, shrubs, etc. There's been some good information that's come out of New Jersey. They actually started a program seven or eight years ago applying liquid larvicides um, using those bacterial products for the larvae, but using it through this, the ultra low volume spray machines. And they actually had some good information. You know, a lot of times we think, well, there's a house there and, you know, the house is going to uh, absorb the spray or the spray is going to hit the house. But actually, they've got really good data that shows it actually goes around the house. You know, because these droplets are, you know, we, we, we target between 30 and 45 microns. Um, you know, they, they, they do follow the wind currents and will sometimes go around some of these impingements. But as you would think, a very, you know, a, a, a largely forested area, um, we're not going to see that 300 foot um, 
um, control by any stretch, but they had to put a number on it. They did cage tests over the years. Um, and operationally, we'll use a 300 foot swath, knowing that in some instances, you know, it's going to be less than that. So that's the that's the largest or the most optimistic. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Point of view. Um, and that's do you do that on both sides of the road at that time? So it's 300 feet on each side when you do. A, it generally. It yeah, generally not, because we like to spray when the wind speeds are between two and 10 miles an hour. So generally, if, if when they start spraying and the wind's taking it across the street, they'll usually stop, drive down the street, turn around and come back. Because we, we have to follow the wind currents, as you would imagine. But also, more importantly, the mosquitoes are following the wind currents as well. Mosquitoes will fly against the wind when they sense CO2. But when they're actively seeking, they're letting the wind glide them along because why expend the energy when they don't have to? So sometimes they'll spray both sides of the road if the wind will shift a little bit on them. But I would say in, mo in many instances, it's simply one side of the road because that's where the, the wind is, is going to take it anyway. Okay, thank you. I'll let somebody else go. Daryl's hand is up. Daryl, you want to go ahead? Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for um, putting effort into getting installations regarding beavers for the flow leveling devices, mm -hmm. uh, which are more enduring and more harmonious, I do believe, for us. So I think that's great. Well, thank you very much, because as you would imagine, there's a fair amount of work involved in it, but um, it is a very beneficial program for us. We try to balance the needs of the beaver with the needs of us humans. Um, many of the um, projects that come to us, uh, be, you know, mosquito control is a secondary thought. You know, this this beaver ponds flooding out the road or it's going over the sewer line or, you know, so many septic systems underwater. We're a secondary thought, but we are able to, in some instances, bring those levels down where the, the beavers can still persist and uh, we can minimize or lessen the impact that's, um, you know, negatively affecting either the residents and hopefully reducing the mosquito habitat, uh, which is our main goal as well. Mm -hmm. uh, just. Uh I had a corporate client at one point that I worked with. They had beaver troubles on their property and they put in one of those devices and it it eliminated the need for having trappers periodically and mm -hmm. kept the water at an acceptable level and everything worked out great, so. When they do work, they do work very well for sure. Is there a role for pre -hatch? How do you decide what the pre-hatch uh, program? Is that something more effective than doing the uh, larval stuff? Or how do you decide where there's a site that's worth doing that? Um, and whether you do that in Sherborne? We look at our historical records. All of the wetland habitats that we treat, um, we keep records of so that we know when applications were done, what life stages we found. Um, on occasion, we'll even um, do species data as well. But for the most part, depending on the wetland, we have a pretty good sense of what species can develop there. The pre-hatch program allows us to do additional larval control that if we were not um, doing it, we wouldn't be able to do. Um, pre-hatch, we're not dipping the wetland because it's frozen. But we know historically, for at least five years, there's been consistent larval activity. We've had to go back year after year after year. So therefore, we do that application. Um, we, we feel traveled for a number of years. We get very good control for about 30 to 40 days, give or take. Um, timing of that is um, the hardest part because once that product becomes wet, it becomes active. Mosquito larvae in the springtime, because the water is so cold and usually very clean, their development through the four stages, they they go through four larval stages, can take two months. So mm -hmm. sometimes that BTI we put in, which only is going to be in that wetland effectively one or two days, if we don't hit that right life stage, um, it's not going to be effective. However, 
the bacterial we're using for the pre-hatch is a formulation that it slowly releases over a 30-day period. So it just allows us to do additional treatments for mosquito larvae just prior to them hatching out from the eggs. Hmm. Are you doing that actively in Sherborn at the moment? I'd have to look at the maps. We do target at last year we went fully operational and we did target every community for at least one application. We did about 54 acres last year in all of our communities. This year we're targeting um, 220. So we will be doing additional areas um, in all of our communities, Sherborn being one of them. Okay. And that yeah. I'm just saying no people who want to. I guess those are being the, that's done in wetlands that you've seen that's both private and public land that you have your data. Yes. From. Correct. Mm -hmm. unless, unless there's a pesticide exclusion, then right. we're not doing those applications because even though it's a bacterial product, it is considered a pesticide. Right. Okay. So we could find out separately where you might be doing it here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Make that, yep. Do that differently. Okay. And would it have been your organization or a different one that did the uh, helicopter drop of BTI in Sherborne last year or the year before? Yes, that was us. Two years ago, um, in, in 2019, we may remember, I certainly do, um, a significant Tripoli outbreak in the Metro West region. It has never happened before. I grew up in Metro West. I've worked here for nearly 40 years. We've never seen anything like it. The state did aerial spraying in Metro West. Again, has never happened. So in 2020, we were able to secure additional funding through the Commonwealth, and we targeted all of our communities that were either high risk or critical risk from Tripoli. We were looking at specific habitats for two different species of mosquito. One that amplifies Tripoli through the birds, and one that picks up Tripoli from the birds and gives it to us. So Sherborne being one of those high risk communities, we did target some air, some wetlands and it was right around the third week of May. And uh, so we were able to get some of those um, um, populations suppressed. Thankfully, we did not record any additional Tripoli either in 2020 or 2021. This year, if you, you know, wanted to ask me what I think is gonna happen, my official answer is I don't know. My professional opinion is um, it's not likely Tripoli is going to be a major factor, but I've been wrong before. Um, you know, again, there's so many factors involved with bird migration patterns and weather patterns, when mosquitoes hatch, um, when they pick up the virus, you know, when they amplify it, when it spills over to us. So there's a lot that's involved, but we're Tripoli tends to run in three year cycles every seven to 10 years. We considered last year to be year three and we recorded no Tripoli statewide. So we're hoping, fingers crossed, that we're out of that cycle and if it does show up, it'll be fairly low levels. But what happened in 2019, we did not want to have occur again. So we expended a lot of time, energy and resources to do certainly on my part to do what I could in my critical and high risk communities, because frankly, I don't want to see those airplanes go overhead again either, because I live in Metro West and I lived in a critical community and it was not a fun time for anybody. Great. Well, this is a, a really comprehensive discussion. Thank you, Tim, for for joining us tonight. Um, I don't see any other questions, so I, I think we can we can wrap it up now. Well, th uh, and thank you, Cindy, for setting this up again. You know, we've worked in Sherborne since 1973. Uh, when I was a district crew leader, it was one of my towns. I loved working in town. Um, so we're always available for these type of presentations or the one on one. You know, drop me an email, call me on the phone. You know, as you probably guessed, since I've been talking practically nonstop since seven o'clock, um, I like what I do and I could probably talk your ear off. So I never hesitate to talk to somebody about what we do, you know, whether they're against what we do, whether they're for what we do. Let's have a conversation and, you know, see if we can educate each other and find the middle ground somewhere. Yeah, super. No, this was a great, this was a great presentation and a great discussion afterwards. And thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for your time. Yes. And, um, for you know sharing with us thank you absolutely absolutely it was my pleasure thank you all yes thank you very much
And thank you for the invitation to the continued dialogue. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.